I'm Dan Finkel, founder of Math for Love and author of Rich Learning Tasks. Rich Tasks are one of the best ways to get your students to develop as competent and powerful problem solvers. Today, I want to talk about the math magic trick and how I prepare for and launch this with my students. There are three things to consider with this Rich Task and with all Rich Tasks. First of all, how to launch to light student curiosity. Second, how to sustain students in productive struggle. And third, how to conclude or wrap up the task to give students a sense of ownership. Let's start with the launch. The first thing to remember is that something absolutely weird is gonna happen in this launch, and we want students to be fully aware of just how crazy it is. So here's the trick. To start, I ask students to think of a number between one and 10. And I'll often do this with the class as well. So say I pick six. Here's how the trick works. The first thing we'll do is add two. In my case, that makes eight, but all students will be doing this on their own and following along on their own paper. After I've added two, I will multiply by two. Eight times two is 16. Again, each student will get their own answer. Following that, I will subtract two. 16 minus two is 14. And then I will, you guessed it, divide by two. 14 divided by two is seven. Happily, it comes out evenly. There's one more step, which is whatever my original number was, I'm now going to subtract that original number from whatever I have at this point. Seven minus six is one. And that's my answer to this round of the math magic trick. Now, here is the crazy thing. No matter what number you pick between one and 10, you end up with one at the end. And what we have here is two very powerful intuitions. On the one hand, how could we know that something like this would be happen? Well, I tell students that I've just checked the numbers between one and 10. I knew that they were all gonna work and come out to be one, so I knew the trick would work. But right away, that gives us a question, which is, well, what other numbers does it work for? If we tried 11, if we tried 13, would it still work? Let me try one of those. And this, again, is something you'd want to do with the students. Part of our goal here is to make sure that the trick itself is really clear so the students know how to do this on their own. So let me try again. I'll pick 13 this time. First step is to add 2, taking me to 15. Next step, multiply by 2 taking me to 30. Next step, subtract two, taking me to 28. Next step is divide by two. Now it seems like I'm pretty far away from where I started, but suddenly 14 minus my original number is one again. The trick still worked, even though I started outside that range from one to 10. Again, that seems crazy. How many numbers could this work for? It feels like it can't work for very many. Maybe it works for some, but something's got to break this trick. Something has got to come out differently than one. I just feel like that has to be true. Why is that my intuition? Well, there's an infinite number of numbers, right? And that's often a discussion I would have with students. How many numbers are there? An infinite number. You can have large numbers. You can have fractions, decimals, negative numbers. There's all sorts of crazy numbers out there. Something's got to break this. And maybe I'll ask students, which number do you think is going to break it? 55? Maybe 55 will break it. That could be one we could try out. Maybe 943 will break it. Maybe two and a half will break it. Maybe negative seven will break it. Maybe zero will break it. I have all these numbers that I want to try out. As soon as students are hooked on this question and really curious about what's going on, and as soon as they have a couple of numbers to try out, we can let them go on their own. If you'd like to launch this using computer slides, I've also included a slide which gives the statement of the problem, the statement of the trick. And I have this in two slides, which first says pick a whole number between one and 10 and do this. And we have the surprise of everyone getting the same answer, which itself is, should be surprising. Did we all start out with the same number? No, how could it be the same answer? And then we have another slide which frames this as a challenge. Pick any number and find one where you apply this trick and the answer won't be one. Now that our students are trying out different numbers, we're going to do our best to keep them in this productive struggle. This means 
If they're feeling like they're not having enough success, can we help scaffold them or give them some numbers to try? This is a task that has a way of frustrating students, but this frustration is very productive and we want to keep them there trying out different numbers. It's great both for practicing their arithmetic, but also for just exploring how this thing works and also laying a foundation for algebraic thinking. Often, I'll actually give a student an example to do along with a certain picture or guide. I might say, let's try to do one half and let's actually draw our one half. Now, when we add two, I'll actually draw our one half plus our two holes. We actually have a picture guide and I've seen students use this and understand how fractions work or understands how decimals work better for the fact of actually having that. By providing them with specific examples to do, we can help keep them engaged and, and give them something else to try when they might be losing steam. The other thing that happens is students might become convinced that this does always work for every number. And in this case, we want to respond with skepticism. Really? Every number? All infinity numbers? How many of you tried? 12? 20? Is that enough to know that something will really always work for everything? There's one other thing that is very likely to happen here, which is that students will make an arithmetic mistake. This is a really exciting thing because when they make an arithmetic mistake or, or misapply the steps of the problem, they'll actually think they've gotten an answer that doesn't come out to one. Now, you may know that it actually does come out to one, but don't give that away. Be happy for them and surprised. Oh, you found one that didn't come out to one? That is fantastic. But we should really be sure, so make sure you check that over. Maybe you should switch with someone else in your group and check it over with them. Finally, some students might actually be able to come up with some kind of algebraic reason or argument that it does always come out to one. If they can truly convince you, despite all your skepticism, be ready with some extra questions in your back pocket. What if you changed all the twos to threes? What would happen then? What if you change them all to fours or fives? What if you change the order of the steps? Those are things that can keep even a student who seems to be well ahead of the pace of the rest of the class engaged with this problem. If you responded with skepticism when students think they have it all figured out and responded by helping scaffold them with concrete examples and visualizations when they're having trouble, you'll find that students may have been engaged in this productive struggle for 30 or 45 minutes. Now it's time to wrap up and give the students a sense of ownership over the work they've done. To wrap up, we'll want to start by asking students what they noticed and what they still wonder about this magic trick. Students should have a lot to say. They may have their stories of what numbers they tried, when they thought that it worked, when they found that it didn't, what discoveries they made, and what conjectures they still have about what may or may not be true about this. There's one very important thing you can do to close this out though, and that is provide some kind of visualization or new way of thinking about this that can help break open this problem. In this case, students are primed for another way of looking at this problem because there's a fundamental problem. There are infinitely many numbers and we only have finite time. How can we do an infinite amount of work all at once? Well, maybe a visualization will help. Imagine that we have a square that represents the number in question. This could also be a bar if you're using bar models uh, and a variable if students know algebra, though frankly the visualizations are more powerful for most students. Let's pick a number. Well, in this case I've picked 147, but I'm going to do something kind of radical, which is I'll add to my first step and I won't actually change that number, I'll just put those two ones in as ones. I'll just draw pictures of them. Those will be my extra dots in this picture. So that is 149, but I'm really thinking about it as 147 plus 2. Now, what's my next step? Well, I want to multiply by 2. Now, what does it mean to multiply this picture by 2? Well, it just means to double it. So I can do that with this picture by doubling it. What's my next step? Well, I'll subtract 2. That I can do without messing with those 147s. Again, I'll just delete two red dots. And now I have the trickiest part, I want to divide by two. Well, this doesn't look like a piece, uh, picture that I can cut in half very easily, but if I slide one of those dots over, suddenly I have two identical pieces. If I divide by two, I cut it in half, I'll just 
erase one of them. There's one more step, which is to subtract my original number. And there it is. It hasn't changed this whole time. It's just been in that blue square. I subtract it, and the answer is 1. We're getting to something very deep and very important, which is when I'm picking a number, I might have the option to not pick that number. Maybe I just leave it as an unknown. Maybe I just leave question marks there or x's and y's. The same argument. I add 2 to my unknown number, and I have my unknown number plus 2. I multiply it by 2. Well, I can still do that with the picture. I subtract 2. I can still do that with the picture. I divide by 2. I can still do that with the picture. I subtract my original number. Even not knowing what that number is, I can subtract it. And the answer is 1. This seems to be an argument that no matter what I pick, no matter what of the infinite possibility of numbers I choose to put in that box, the answer will always be 1. Does that convince you? Does that convince your students? This is something that you'll have to let them talk out between them. And some students will be convinced and some students won't be. This is a deep idea that takes a while to settle in. But you are actually priming them to own the fundamental idea of algebra, which is that you can work with variables, you can work with unknowns, and do an infinite amount of work at once in one go, just with this kind of visualization or equation. All the materials I've mentioned in this video are available in the description below. And let me know how it goes for you. I'd love to hear comments, especially about were you able to launch and grab your students' curiosity? Could you keep them in productive struggle and wrap up and give them a sense of ownership? Please comment and pass this along to teachers or others who you think might enjoy it. My name's Dan. I hope you've enjoyed this tour of a rich task. Good luck.